On Christmas Day, Washington tells his army to prepare. After months of defeat and loss, they understand his purpose. The army will now take the offensive. They will be crossing the Delaware back to New Jersey. Shortly before departing, Washington has American Crisis read aloud. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and to repulse it. Time hath found us. Thomas Paine. It will be a monumental task. Washington's men must ford a near frozen river in a blizzard and get across fast enough to take the enemy before dawn by surprise. Yet Washington's leadership, his army, and the revolution all ride on the success of this singular mission. Washington himself will lead the soldiers into battle for the first time in the war. The general knows that if they fail, there will be no more chances. At 11 p.m., the boats begin to cross. It will be harder than they had even imagined. It was as severe a night as I ever saw. The frost was sharp, the current difficult to stern, the ice increasing, the wind high, and at 11, it began to snow. It was only with the greatest care and labor that the horses and artillery could be ferried over the river. Captain Thomas Rodney, Continental Officer. It takes most of the night to get the army over. It costs them severely in time. As dawn approaches, this surprise attack on the Hessian forces at Trenton grows nearly impossible. For a moment, Washington considers turning back. It made me despair of surprising the town. As I well knew, we could not reach it before the day was fairly broke. I determined to push on at all events. General George Washington. 5 a.m. The weather worsens and the temperatures drop even further. The soldiers, some with only rags on their feet, begin to succumb to the elements. I was so benumbed with cold that I wanted to go to sleep. Had I been passed unnoticed, I should have frozen to death without knowing it. But as good luck attended me, Sergeant Madden came and made me walk about. John Greenwood, Continental Pfeiffer. In a swift move, he catches the Hessians off guard. It sets off a fierce battle. Hessian soldiers scramble to grab their muskets and meet the enemy. Colonel Rawl wakes up to a battle already underway. He had been expecting something from the rebels, but nothing of this scale. Nor is this the same army the Hessians once met in New York. Now the Continentals fight with fierce spirit. In bloody, chaotic engagements, they hold their own. Trenton is a small battle in numbers, but it is a vicious and closely fought one. Colonel Rawl is shot and mortally wounded. His men lay down their weapons and surrender. There would later be rumors that the Hessians had been partying. In fact, they fought nobly, but were soundly defeated. The myth is that the Hessians were drunk, that they were celebrating Christmas, that their commander was drunk, and I think none of that was true. The Hessians fought with great courage. Their officers led them with great resolve. The Battle of Trenton is over in less than two hours. Twenty-two Hessians are dead and nearly 900 captured. Washington describes American casualties as very trifling. 
the victors and their prisoners march back up river and cross the Delaware again. They reach camp in Pennsylvania, exhausted, ill, malnourished. But they had marched 20 miles, defying both the weather and the odds. News of the battle spreads through the colonies. It really suddenly gave them a new sense of the possibility of a revolution that many of them thought had been lost. And the word began to spread. Now they saw that there was an army that had looked the enemy in the face and won. And this just gave a huge surge of courage. The news also reaches the British and General Howe. The unfortunate and untimely defeat at Trenton has thrown us farther back from the great encouragement it has given to the rebels. Howe orders General Cornwallis to return to New Jersey with 8,000 men. Meanwhile, Washington convenes a war council with his top aides. They decide to cross the Delaware again to take full advantage of the British confusion. The weather has gotten even worse. Bitter cold, deep snow. The Delaware has nearly frozen over, making another crossing even more difficult than the first. But in the final days of 1776, Washington's army again makes its way across the Delaware into New Jersey. Many enlistments will expire at the end of the year, and Washington implores his men to stay. December 30th, 1776, Washington and his army are in Trenton, where they had defeated the Hessians just four days earlier. They expect to be attacked from the north. Ten miles up the road, thousands of British and Hessian troops are gathering in Princeton, preparing to march to Trenton. Washington positions some of his men halfway between Trenton and Princeton. Their assignment is to delay the inevitable British advance. Back in Trenton, Washington's forces are ready. January 2nd, 1777. The rebels' newfound confidence is about to be tested. General Cornwallis and a massive force are marching toward Trenton, eager for an all-out battle. Along the way, Americans engage the British in a series of skirmishes, delaying their advance. The delays are costly to the British, who finally reach Trenton at sundown. Washington and his troops have taken positions on the south side of the Assunpink Creek. This is the second battle of Trenton. Three times the British attack the Assunpink Creek Bridge. Three times they are repelled, taking heavy casualties. As darkness falls, the Americans are encamped on one side of the creek, the British on the other. The Redcoats expect to easily defeat Washington the next morning. In the night, Washington had some of his men build fires, and they could hear sounds of digging. They thought, oh, the Americans are entrenching there on the hill. No, they're trying to keep warm with all these fires. Meanwhile, Washington's whole army marched by back roads and completely outflanked the British army. 
that was sitting in front of Trenton, and the next thing you know, in the early morning, they attacked the British garrison in Princeton. This time, the frigid weather is an asset, turning muddy roads solid, enabling Washington and his men to move through the night. It is dawn, January 3rd. American General Nathaniel Greene is leading his troops on Quaker Road, heading north to Princeton. A mile and a half from town, they encounter British troops heading south. With a ferocious British bayonet charge, the Battle of Princeton begins on the farms of William and Thomas Clark. In the midst of the chaos, Washington arrives with reinforcements and inspiration. He rode down the line between the British and the Americans and gave the order to fire while he was right there in between the two lines. And one of Washington's aides, uh, uh, Colonel Fitzgerald, put his hat over his head, over his face, like that, because he thought sure Washington was a dead man. And this huge billow of smoke rose from the muskets on both sides. And when it cleared away, there was Washington still on his horse. It was just miraculous. The Battle of Princeton is another stunning American victory, another cause for hope. General Nathaniel Greene wrote about the startling turn of events. The two late actions at Trenton and Princeton have put a very different face upon affairs. And a good many British officers began to doubt that the American war was winnable. And this only a few weeks after they thought that it had been won. Following victory at Princeton, George Washington decides to march north to Morristown, New Jersey. He will spend the winter with his wife Martha and his most trusted officers, rebuilding the army, planning future strategy. The war is certainly not over. There will be six more years of fighting. But there has been a remarkable turnaround. A British historian later summed up the battles of Trenton and Princeton. It may be doubted, he wrote, whether so small a number of men ever employed so short a space of time with greater and more lasting effects upon the history of the world. If the Americans had failed at Trenton and Princeton, or either one of them, they would have become peaceful, submissive, obedient, servants of His Majesty George III, and the whole uh, marvelous spirit of, of, of independence and liberty that has animated this country would have really vanished. In those 10 days, as 1776 gave way to a new year, despair gave way to hope. Gloom was replaced by confidence, and a new nation, still in its infancy, was beginning to stand on its own. After losing Philadelphia to the British, Benjamin Franklin needs a decisive victory at Saratoga to convince France to back the rebels. His job is essentially to make it appear to the French that the American cause is a viable one and that the Americans can win this contest. Those are all of them, at that point, fictions. A declaration of war between France and England would change what was once a colonial uprising into a world war.